Hello, everyone. This is Yusai. Welcome to Let's Talk, and what an amazing week this is going to be and have been. It is celebration of Amer- Asian. Pacific American Heritage Month, and two weeks ago, I was able to get all these guests from models from Asia and also Coco Rocha to come on here to talk about the Asian influence in the fashion industry. And this week, we continue that celebration when guests that are Asian American in different industries, in food as well as beauty and fashion. Today, my guest is Kathleen Ho from New York Magazine, The Cut. She's going to share her journey with us and talk about how the beauty industry has been evolving and inclusive. With Asian faces. Hello, good to see you. Hi, you said. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for being part of the conversation, and thank you for being part of this week's very important celebration of Asian American celebration. So I'm so happy to have you here. We have yet to work together, but we talk quite a bit. We do. We do. We're both Taiwanese. We have a, a bunch of things in common. Um, I was just watching episodes of your cooking show. And your first episode was actually in Tainan, which is where my parents grew up and where I've been to visit multiple times as a child. <laughs> well, thank you for watching that. So Street to Kitchen is a show that I had an opportunity to make last year um, back in Taiwan. I been, haven't been to Taiwan for over 20 years. And when I had an opportunity to do a cooking show, and a travel show, I wanted to start for where my home is and, and revisit the places I have not been for so long. I mean, it's, it's crazy going back. Um, when was the last time you were in Taiwan? I think it was um, probably last year, last April or so. I try to go back like once a year, once every few years because um, all my relatives are there. I love Taiwan. It's a place I have such fond memories of. I used to go every summer when I was little, and it's it's like you said in the um, in a lot of the episodes. It's really interesting to see that that um, kind of juxtaposition between like a super uh, traditional kind of. Um, please, but then you're also seeing a lot of like Western influences as well. But it's one of those places where you can still really see both sides, which is part of the reason why I love it so much. I, I agree with you. I really learn a lot by going back because it takes about six weeks to film and four weeks pre production. And, yeah. and so I was there for over two months. And it was, it's crazy because certain part of the era in Taiwan that it looks like it never changed. It's yeah. still historic. Tainan, especially, it is mm-hmm. a, it is a, a city that, that is surrounded by temples and shrines. It is such a fascinating, beautiful culture there and the community there were incredible. And the street food, oh, the street yeah. food is street just food. <laughs> phenomenal. So for those of you guys, the two Taiwanese here talking about Taiwanese food, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> we, I mean, we, Asians, we love it. just always start talking about food, right? Of course, this is not always in our Asian culture that when we get together is dumpling time or noodle right. time mahjong time and then we do in our culture we do celebrate over food and i like italian culture and, and greek culture food i think yeah. surrounds all of us and brings us together which you know we've seen that in this pandemic that the commonality of what we need to do is fuel ourselves and every day we see more igs popping up of people sharing their recipes and i, I love that i love seeing a michelin chef cooking in their kitchen and making everyday meals so we can learn how to cook like them and eat their food vicariously you know that's the that's the lovely change that we're having and I actually really appreciate it what have you been cooking in quarantine wow so it you know since I took on the responsibility and I call responsibility because I find there's a greater purpose here for let's talk that I started this initiative where let's talk that for every guest that comes on the show, we donate 500 masks to first responders. And part of the initiative was because one, I want to have a greater purpose for the show. And two was because it was actually very difficult in the very beginning yeah. of, of the creation of the show, which we all know. People are like, uh, what's a fashion photographer have to say about food? And food people are going, what is it? But <laughs> what, you know, they're saying the opposite. The food people are like, what does he know about food? He's a fashion photographer. And and I wanted to take this opportunity to really combine the two worlds. I, I, I know really well the food and the culture. And then happened to be Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. And it was so important for me to, to have the lesson last year to go back to Taiwan to really reflect on who I am. And I learned a lot from that. And during this time, I have to say, I learned even more. So it's so important for me to curate these um, week after week women celebration and women empowerment photographer celebrations to to CEOs in the business that are run by women or or just Asian Americans breaking into the industry here. I think that's what I've been up to. I cooking wise, 
I am a lazy, <laughs> lazy cook. Whatever is easiest, I make. I love my air fryer, you guys. I'm gonna get into um, Instant Pot soon. Everybody keeps saying, if you um, like air fryer, you're gonna love Instant Pot. My family loved Instant Pot. <laughs> There's this combination like Instant Pot slash air fryers now. Wow, oh my God. It's... <laughs> <laughs> so I make, I've been making a lot of chicken wings and drums and, and easy, just anything that's easy because amount of time you and I talked a little bit about this, I actually feel more busier than ever because yeah. of the responsibility of curating and learning how to be kind through the process as you and I both work in fashion we know how booking models are like and how the booking talents are like it's immediate if they don't right, right. answer you means they're not interested and you move yeah. on right or like and I've just whole, second, whole, third whole like you know <laughs> and 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 then same thing when I reached out to you, I think it was two and a half weeks ago, and I said, oh, give, yeah. me, give me a moment. I want to talk to you. I love for you to on the sh be on the show. But I wanted to make sure it was a week that really resonate your messaging and who you are and how you have influenced me in the industry. And you're among amazing guests this week. I mean, we're ending with Lisa Ling. <laughs> I know. Of, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of blown away by, by the fact that she's coming on. So I'm like honor because she was my icon you know she's still my icon in yeah. my eye of somebody who's so intelligent and and just incredible she's been doing since she's 16 i know you know that but she's been doing it since she's 16 that's incredible I but what weeks ago before the pandemic happened in la and she was like a beauty event she was interviewing helen mirren and vela davis and she was so good at it <laughs> So, so you guys, yeah. you might, might want to watch it on Friday and see how I, I do. <laughs> That's a good one. That's going to be my test. Now, you're number 60 guests. So I think by now I better be able to hold my own in these conversations. Well, are you, are you going to keep going? Are you like 100? Are you going to stop? Or are you just going to keep going? Well, the first, uh, the, the original goal was actually to set a goal of ways, raising 100, 1,000, uh, I'm sorry. The original goal for this talk was to raise 100,000 masks. And we already achieved that goal. And that was kind of the goal. And now we're just raising the bar. We have more donations happen today and I can't stop. If the, the, if the kindness is gonna spread, I will continue to do this. Now, I know a lot of places people are beginning to try to find a new normal and getting back to work. So scheduling is going to be harder. So it might not be able to be IG live. I can convert it into a podcast that can be pre-record or even a Zoom conversation is pre-recorded and rebroadcast it. That's kind of the goal. I would love nothing more that the audience and the community allow me to continue to do this, even if I'm not shooting. I, 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 do, I do love it. And I hope people are enjoying it. You've been watching. What do you think? I've been loving it. I think it's also just nice to see people in their home, like in their element. And then, <laughs> you know, we don't get to see your home, but because <laughs> you have this professional lighting set up. But I think it's just nice to see everyone's kind of at home. Everyone's kind of, if we're, I mean, we're lucky to be at home, right? Um, and I think it, there's like a, there's like a very kind of like nice camaraderie, I think, with like something like this that you, um, might not get with like a TV, like a, something you see like on TV. It's like a little more personal. It, I see something like that. It is. And I have to say, you know, you and I talk offline many times, but when yeah. we said talking in this era means we text each other and somebody's an emoji <laughs> back. That's talking. But yeah. for, <laughs> for the first time, um, that people are beginning to break that line of the fourth wall and actually talk to each other face to face. Right. I find myself that I'm not able to get on the phone with people just to hear them. I always right. ask people, can you please FaceTime me so I can I see know. your face? When you first asked me to do that, I was like, no, I can't. <laughs> because I was just not ready. <laughs> um, but I was like, uh, no, I can't FaceTime right now. I think I like, I like, we could do it tomorrow at like 6 p.m. But I, I think the, the walls are starting to come down a little bit with that. Like, I mean, like, I'm sure just thinking with you, like, at night, you just have all these multiple Zooms going on. Like, you're Zooming with, like, your parents. You're Zooming with, like, your friends. And I think, like, taking the – it's – I think this whole thing is uh, – one of the good things that has happened is that it's made me more uh, – take more specific time to make sure that I'm checking in on, like, friends and, like, checking with my family. And, and like, we don't do that enough when we're in a normal no. time. We no. definitely did not <laughs> – the assignments in the fashion industry is so fast and, and you've got to produce on a monthly basis. And, and with the online publication that, that you run, 
it's yeah. daily basis, right? You're putting right. out new info on a daily basis. Let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk about the, where you are at uh, The Cut and what are your contributions there? Yeah, so I've been at The Cut now for, I think, maybe five years, but um, it feels like a long time, um, but also feels like a short time. Um, but I've been running and doing everything beauty related to The Cut, and it's just grown so quickly. And so my day-to-day, -day, I mean, it's changed a lot. It used to be like a morning full of like meetings with different people, like breakfast meetings. And I go into the office and like, right. Um, and then at nighttime, there'd be like more events and things like that. And then now it's just, um, it's, it's a lot different, obviously. Like I'm in my apartment, I'm working from home, but, um, it's, uh, I think in the time that I've been there, it's been really interesting to see how, um, people's approaches to beauty and the mm -hmm. way that beauty has changed a lot. I think, the, for example, the conversation around diversity, I think, exploded basically in the past five years. It's always been something that people have really always wanted beauty to be diverse. But I think now that is something that for any modern beauty brand or any modern beauty publication, like diversity is just, it's a given, it's a given now. It's a no brainer now. If you, if, if Hunter was no brainer, but did you, when you were there, so you've been there for five years and mm -hmm. when you're there, obviously you're an Asian American. When yeah. you in that position, working and talking about beauty all the time, is it a conscious decision to make sure that you tap into your own heritage and culture and reflect that in your work? It's conscious for me in the sense that um, writing is obviously very personal. And a lot of times with beauty, like for me, I write things in first person. So mm. it, it's not something that like I uh, specifically like sought out necessarily. But it's also natural because it's just part of me and who I am. And um, the cut has always celebrated diversity in all forms, whether it be beauty or fashion or whatnot. So it just kind of goes with like the, the inherent values of like the publication. Um, well, but I that that's interesting because we know that different publications have their own ethos, their own own <laughs> DNA, who they speak to. And we definitely have seen that that pendulum start to swing the other way. And the cut was already ahead of its time doing so. But how do you continue to to push that that messaging across in this such a busy, noisy space? Uh, I think for me, it's also just uh, seeking out maybe lesser referred stories or, you know, trying to really expand that. Um, like, for example, I remember one of the first big supermodel interviews I did was with Lu Wen. And everyone, a lot of people know who Lu Wen is. She's a huge, huge, the, the biggest, I would say, Asian supermodel that we've had ever, right? Yes. And I think in the U.S., her face is very well known. People have seen her in, like, the ads for Estee Lauder. And she's been in the face of a lot of campaigns. Um, but I don't think a lot of people knew that much about who she was and kind of what her story was like in America. And um, I did an interview with her like a few years ago, and I think her her team was maybe a little surprised that an American publication wanted to interview her. One, not because not she's super well known, but also because you know she's she's pretty fluent in English, but she's not like perfect. And I think she felt a little bit of uh, a little bit of like trepidation. I think wanting to do the interview, but I think knowing that I was also Chinese, Taiwanese, and and she was able she spoke Mandarin and a mix of English, but just I think having that understanding. Um, between us uh, and like wanting to do that story um, I think that's just like one of the ways that, that like uh, I was trying to kind of connect um, with her connect with her and end up being one of the most read stories that we had for the site I think in that particular month and it did incredibly well on Instagram first of all because she has so 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 many fans and I think a lot of people were curious to know more about her and had like really loved her face and kind of loved who she was, but uh, we're kind of wanting to know more about like her story. And like, she's really interesting in the sense that um, I think that like when you, maybe to other people when they look at her, they're just like, oh, she's like very beautiful. Like obviously, of course she'd be a model, right? But to her and for people that are kind of familiar with Asian beauty standards, I don't think that's necessarily the case. Like she has mm -hmm. features that I think traditionally um, we're not seeing as being like a prize of being beautiful. Um, things like she has like monolids rather than double eyelids, right? That's like a, a little thing that um, if you're not familiar with kind of the stigma of having different eyelid shapes, you might not understand like why that's a big deal. Um, but like in Asia, she's kind of revered now as a beauty icon partially because 
she doesn't necessarily have all like a lot of the things that were prized traditionally as being like super beautiful. So. But I think the conversation happens is how a Western culture perceive how Asian mm -hmm. should be or or should look, and I see it more so in in the editorial models than the commercial models that that they the magazine have a tendency to one super slanted eyes, almost invisible right. eye Asian guys, yeah. and then clearly a jawline that is chiseled like crazy, but just a very much of a, a stereotype of an Asian male model. And then when it comes to female model, I do see a range, right? You get right. the you get you get the Luans and you get the Fei Fei who is more rounder face, a heart shaped yeah. face and, and Luan definitely more in a classic nineties model with a long face yeah. and a longer, stronger nose. And mm -hmm. but but I got, we got to see Lu Wen grew in this in the Western culture, and it was really nice to see that as an Asian American. I loved it. I loved to seeing that. Oh, they're embracing an Asian person to be an international brand for Estee Lauder. However, I did question at the time when you start seeing this. There was a bit of not a backlash, but there was a conversation happened, and it was quite right. noisy that a lot of the Asian publication spoke loudly that she doesn't represent the Asian community because right. she's not a typical Western standard, nor is she a typical Eastern standard. And it's right. so nice now through time and I think education and also exposure, right? Continue to bombard people with billboards and ads and saying, this yeah. is now the new beauty standard. It, right. it has changed the dialogue. We are, we are shifting, we are changing because what is, what, from a beauty director point of view, what is the perfect Asian representation of beauty? I don't even know how to define that. I mean, who knows? It's also not just one person, right? I think that the reason why a lot of, like you said, these publications were like, this doesn't represent us is because uh, we're not a monolith, right? There are so mm -hmm. many, so many of us, there's so many different versions of beauty. So when you have something that's so constructive and someone's meant to be this one penultimate vision of beauty, no one's going to agree with that overall, right? Which is why, again, diversity is so important because you need to have multiple kind of different versions spectrums. of yeah. you know spectrum so you can kind of see yourself in in a lot of different ways rather than having one person be responsible for you know um being everything but that's the same with criticism with like crazy rich asians right like when the movie came out people were like this doesn't represent me like this is not what asia is truly like and of, of course it's not like it's one movie it's like that. But just for the people out there, I actually know the real people who are who are the crazy rich Asians. <laughs> They're all from Singapore, and I worked with them before. So um, the story is actually quite tame. It's actually uh, the lesser crazy than they're more crazier than that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and I when know. I say crazy, I mean wealth. They're, they're way wealthier than what a TV right. movie actually right. represented. If they actually show the the wealth they have, you would just go, "Oh, that's not even humanly possible." But it's kind of <laughs> like Sultan of Brunei, right? <laughs> it's a, right. all everything under the sun. But it's it's interesting that that movie did make a culture change. All of a sudden, we were popular. Asian were popular. And I said this story before a friend of mine called me and go, oh, I didn't know Asian people were funny. I was like, wow, that's what you got out of that movie. Great. That's great education. <laughs> but, 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 you know, I don't know how to, you're younger than me. So, you know, you're, are you a Generation Z or are you a millennial? No, I think I'm like the older side of a millennial. I don't know. <laughs> Too old to be like on TikTok and like that, but. <laughs> never too old. But it's interesting because over the years working in America, I definitely have find in both in both industry of, of, yeah. of art and, and fashion, I definitely find that we have to work harder and we struggle to break into the industry and always have a question whether or not we can be there as an Asian person. And then I find myself, maybe not you, but I do find myself competing against our own community because there's so little of it to go around and, and 10 years ago um it's it's few photographers were asian right there we have the iconic walter chin and that was the only asian photographer's work nan golden you know i can look at it and go oh there's a last name you know doing that period and go doing all this stuff i i just can't i couldn't find like asian women photographers to emulate right. because I dra gravitate to Asian work and, and women photography more than I actually did when I was growing up as a photographer. So when I look at like work like Mary Allen Mark, I want to find the Asian version of Mary Allen Mark to, to be able to to reference and be able to to grow from. And, and we've seen that in the last 10 years that all of a sudden there's a bloom of Asian designers 
and Asian photographers, Asian beauty editors and beauty directors. I think that had lots to do with the fact that China opened up is China Vogue. And that kind of started a new conversation of a new frontier that nobody thought that to even look at. And we know the population there and the consumerism there is, is what drives the entire economy and fashion right. there. So yeah. when this started to happen, when the transition started to happen, um, did, did you feel responsible in any way to make sure that you do put a spotlight on Asian stories um, when possible? Um, yes, for sure. I think that, um, remember, I mean, knowing how I grew up, right, like similar to you in the sense that I feel like I didn't, um, I would look at like the mass head, for example, for a magazine, I wouldn't see any names that were Asian, or I saw one, I would see Josie, and I'd be like, who is this Josie? How did Asian get to be in the industry? <laughs> um, so I always think it's, uh, I just never grew up seeing um, that many people that were in mm. the media industry, that were in the entertainment industry. I saw, um, and so I always wanted to see more of that. I wanted to do that. I mean, I knew when I looked at magazine that I wanted to do that. So I think I, I feel responsible in the sense that I want people um, to know that it's possible, obviously. And like you, you have the opportunity to do everything. <laughs> um, I think that the first time I went to Taiwan when I was little, right? That was the first time that I, I saw Asians are obviously doing everything there because like they're the only, it's, it's Taiwanese. You see them and you see them and they're like Taiwanese movie stars or Taiwanese pop stars or like Taiwanese actresses, like Taiwanese magazine editors and everything. And it's not, it wasn't limited in the sense that you, you would see it in America. Um, so this is why I feel responsible. Like when Crazy Rich Agents came out, obviously I wanted to do a huge promotion around that to make sure that that was being celebrated as being the milestone that it was. Um, you know, when I can, I, uh, when there are Asian makeup artists or Asian hair talent that I really like, um, I definitely try to like reach out to them and get to know them and um, Asian writers and things like that, but not even just like Asians, but just like, I mean, people that are diverse in general. Um, but there, it's nice because there are a lot of different um, we, there are a lot of us now, more more so, I would say. It seems like a lot, but it, I think there are more of us in the industry now. And people like you reaching out, like, it's just, it's. I think it's important to create, like, a sense of community, right? I think that's something that we're still struggling to do. Um, and uh, there are a lot of us, and I think that uh, there are a lot, there's, I see more and more, like, kind of Asian networking groups, like, um, and Asian kind of, like, affinity magazines. Like, my friend Dora, for example, she has one called I See that's, like, a, kind of like Asian interest magazine that's online. Um, and I think it's also important to like, make sure you create that community by like right. mentoring people that are younger than you that like reach out. I'm sure you probably get like hundreds of thousands of like DMs from people a day. Um, I get like a far lesser amount than that. Or anyone tries to reach out, like if they're Asian or not, I always try to respond because I remember what it was like trying to break into this industry and like blind emailing, blind reaching out to people. And just asking them like how 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 did you do it? And I wanted to know. And and, and it's true because that in, the, in the Asia covers the entire continent of India as well. And I have a lot of I have a lot of people write me from India. And it's a lot. It's a lot to go through all the DMs. I try to do my best to get to them and, and inspire them. But you're right, because it is tough. And I find that over the last five years, we have made progress. We have made organic progress, I hope. And even knowing that an Asian film wins the Oscar is so, right. so important. You know, like you mentioned earlier, Josie's one was on TV on Entertainment Tonight a lot. And then when I saw him on TV, and it does give me a reflection of hope and going, okay, if this is a path I want to do, there is a hope and that there are network out there that will put an Asian person on television. And, you know, I experienced that firsthand when I did um, American Next Top Model <laughs> years ago. And before then, I was known as a photographer and I was doing really well in my career. There wasn't like I needed to change career. It was just opportunity that was given to me. And I was like, why not? Let's do it. And, and, and I remember meeting with CW, uh, doing a casting and then when I, when I came in to, to meet with the team and I met with CW directly. And I asked them, actually, I said, how much Asian representation is, has been on, on CW? 
He says, not many. And I looked at him, I go, for that reason alone, you need to hire me. And I got the job. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, and, and, and top model did celebrate diversity. We have African yeah. Americans, we have, you know, everybody said top models. But there, there was, um, there wasn't a, there was a heavy stake in the Asian um, voice in it. And, and I'm so happy that I got to do it. I still think Tara Banks top today, tomorrow, the next day, because I end up going to Asia to do the Asia next top model show. And, and all that was so important to me because you and I know that a lot of people who become super successful as Asian people in a Western culture, mm -hmm. they really go back to where they're from and continue to celebrate their heritage. I don't have a um, reasoning why. Uh, perhaps people just feel like, well, I accomplished it already in the Western mm -hmm. hemisphere. I don't need to go back to where I'm from. And for me, it was so, so important to do Asia Next Top Model. And it wasn't for for the financial reasons because they yeah. do, don't have the budget. <laughs> and, but it was truly because I wanted to be that person who is embracing his culture and diversity and, and having the fact that it, I had some authoritarian, I have a little bit of authority in the subject matter because I made it in the US and I want to share that, that, that knowledge with the Asian community through Asia Next Top Model. And I, I, I hope in, to see more of that in our industry. Yeah, I think it, it's it's tough. I think the, the community thing is something um, we definitely all need to work at. <laughs> um, you know, I think that's across the creative industry in general, but just especially, um, I think also there's a difference. Like I think Asian Americans obviously are trying to form a community, but then like the Asian Asians, they have their own community and we're just okay. we're so, so, so big. Um, but I think it, like, like you said, there are a lot of different things that I think are like making a slow difference. And I think we're getting there. When it things like um, AP or 10 month, um, I think, I mean, the fact that we even have a month, like, and that it's something we're celebrating. That's something that's kind of, well, I think it's only been really relatively new on social media, maybe in the past like two years. Couple years. Uh, yeah, right? but the festival is amazing. When they, when they can do the festival, when it's open to public, Yes. It's the best street food day you'll ever have because every region of Asia get together and they throw it. It's in LA, right? It's in LA and the biggest I food. I something like that in New York. I don't think we, I mean, pandemic aside, I don't think we had that even before in New York. Well, we need to make sure that happens. <laughs> <laughs> we can throw a party because God knows that one thing about Asia that tie all of us together is dumplings and noodles. We can have dumplings and noodle party. You know, that's what we all love, <laughs> dumplings and noodles. But it's, it's, it is a, it's been a really growing experience for me too. Just, just, you know, I went through a period of time. I'm not sure you did because I came to the United States when I was 13 years old. And I, I did not want, I wasn't comfortable in my own skin. And, you know, we, I didn't want to bring rice as my lunch to school. And, and, and it was not something that, that we're proud of. And then if your parents speak to you in Mandarin in public in middle of America, when nobody else spoke a different language than English, you saw some feel ashamed and embarrassed, you know, and that's, that, that, that stayed with me through my high school years, right? You yeah. wish you can, we all wish we can just blend in. Can we just blend in? But the fact is actually you don't ever want to blend in. Now you get older, you realize, oh, Blending in is not good. Right. <laughs> you want to stand out. Right. So, you know what I mean? In some way, yeah. not by choice, but I was standing out as a sore thumb being the only Asian person in my school, you know? Yeah. So if we can teach a young generation of Asian Americans that able to be able to embrace that, and, and I think it's easier now, um, now I sound like an old man saying this, because when we, 20 years ago, there wasn't a lot of Asian people in my high school, but now there are high schools that's just predominantly Asian and white yeah. people are actually, right. Caucasians are actually minorities, you know? Right. It's right. Or like in the certain... rich high schools and rich like elementary schools that are teaching Mandarin in schools. <laughs> oh, and one of my really close friends, MJ Data, editor-in-chief of Sports yeah. Illustrated, her, his son, her son speaks perfect Mandarin and he's like six foot tall redhead. And when I get on FaceTime and he's like, Ni hao ma? I'm all, oh, wait, hold on. Switching gear. Right. <laughs> We're speaking Mandarin. <laughs> and he's, right. and to me, that's awesome. I don't care if people want to learn Asian culture, Asian language, because it's, it's a trend or not, as long as actually promotes diversity and learning and, and inclusion in, in our industry. It's all, it's all a plus. 
you know, it's just so fact you wanted to learn how to. Yeah, I don't see it as a negative either. I think it's just more yeah. understanding and it's better for everyone, right? I mean. So how, well, how, do, we, how do we move forward in the industry to continue to push this in, at least in the beauty realm, in your expertise area? What is it that we can do as a community to support that? Hmm. Well, I think that, like you said, like, we know, diversity is obviously a buzzword, right? But it needs to go along like beyond that it needs to not just be a trendy thing but be something that continues like it's just a given for the next like 100 years next 200 years whatever mm. um and i think like uh understanding what it really means which is to have like all different kind of viewpoints all different celebrate all different kinds of races and ethnicities and all that kind of stuff uh all body types you know um and just making that a given no matter what no matter the brand um and just make that something that's um, evident in the packaging, evident in like the products, evident in like the um, imagery and things like Are that. Are you seeing and that shift happening more and more in at least in some of the bigger brands? I mean, we saw what happened with Victoria's Secret where they had no choice but move because the, the consumer made them make that shift. We saw that right. very evidence way because they they were very vocal about not having transgender yeah. on the runway. They were very vocal about plus sizes, not fantasy women uh, for, right. for people to want to watch, which the moment those words dropped, it alienated the entire population, a group of people who actually celebrated that brand. So yeah. they have since pivoted. And we see a lot right. of my friends of color on there. We have Golden Barbie there. We have Shuji there. You know, with just beautiful models. Um, of different colors and, and race and different hair textures. I love every, I love hair textures that defines where we're from. I just love that beautiful hair texture from different region of the world. And, and do you see that more happening now in the beauty industry as well? Which, which really bizarre for me to ask that question because we know beauty industry products, Asian products are still the best. <laughs> The best. They are. They are. Yeah, the best. But do you they start? Are. Do you see changes happening in, in? I guess in the way of their, their DNA, and are they trying to change it? The uh, the Theo as a company, you know. I think I think for sure. With I mean the Fen I think Fenty changed everything, right? Like the fact that Forty Foundations is now seen as this, uh, automatic barometer for like that's just the, the baseline now. I think if you launch something with less than that. The internet will shame you to because it's not wow. diverse um and i think it's something that if you're a big brand you're definitely aware of and a lot of the smaller brands too i think that they're they're aware that they need to be diverse um are you having so, this conversation with the, i know you know a lot of the ceo of the, yeah. uh, the the beauty brands and then the marketers and per, uh, the merchandisers are you guys having conversations um communicate all the time about the shift of the industry and how you can adapt and actually grow together um, I think that a lot of them have been putting things in the move for like the past, I think since Fenty came out, what, like three, three, four years ago, mm -hmm. I think that everyone's been aware that every campaign that they have now, if they, it needs to have diverse spokespeople and it should be diverse in age. Like, um, I mean, the fact that like L'Oreal, for instance, they have like Viola Davis, they have Helen Mirren, like these two people as like spokesmodels, like Urban Decay has their like pretty different campaign and they have like uh they have like a range of people from including men um so i think it's just like a, i think it's a, a thing that everyone knows they have to do now i think the question is what we're going to do going forward right like is it going to continue to be diverse i mean i hope so mm -hmm. um and but the responsibility of making sure yeah. that diverse conversation happens i think a lot has to come from the journalists right when yeah. when your magazine write an article that's poignant and it gets to millions and millions of viewers then the conversation continues. I think it's because what happens is 24 hour cycle news, right? This thing is happening and then 24 hours later, we move on to another news. I guess what I'm saying is that how do we keep that conversation continue going? Not just because it's Asian Pacific right. American Heritage Month and not just because of that, not because I'm happened to be Asian talking to an Asian person, but yeah. what do we do in, in the everyday, in our, in, in, at least in our industry, how do we promote and push that? Well, I don't think even the power comes from me. I think the, the regular consumer, they have a lot of power, probably even mm. maybe more so than me in terms of like being able to direct brands to explain what they want, right? They can vote with their dollars. And I think that part of the reason why brands have um, 
pivoted more towards diversity is because they see that it makes business sense. And that mm. is what I think what is most impactful and what's most obvious to them, right? They see that the success of Fenty and they saw both the press and the success in terms of dollar amounts. And they were just like, Oh, like this just makes sense. It's like a one-to-one, -one, right? Well, isn't and that sad though? Isn't that sad? We have to get sad. to, we have to get to the one-to-one -to, -one to embrace diversity and, 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 and how, how antiquated are these companies who actually have to, I, 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 it baffles me. It just baffles it's, me. How are they not baffling, know? But also, their businesses, right? So I guess they're looking at the bottom line. That's like what they're doing. It's something like Victoria's Secret, right? For example, for a long time, they didn't change a lot of their casting. And it wasn't really until their business was in trouble that they were like, oh, this clearly is not working. We need to do something different, right? So that's why I think the, the power of the, or like the, the regular consumer choosing, and that's also why partially like, being um, being more aware of who you're buying from, what you're purchasing, what's that, what the, what what that's supporting, and ethically doing it, I think makes a big difference. Ob mm. Obviously, like the articles and you know us are important too, but like there are more consumers than there are us, right? And I think we can shine a light on the causes and the things that we want to support. But I think that the I think the social media has really empowered people to be able to have their voice and be able to speak and if they don't like something to be able to say something which i think is is great that's like more powerful than us <laughs> absolutely and, well yes and and you know and still i can't believe we're still having this conversation because of xenophobia yeah. right now is so prevalent because of the the, co uh, the covet but it's it's to me that I'm blessed and you're blessed that we're in this bubble of, of West Coast and East Coast. There's a huge right. span of a middle of America community that still aren't aware of the Asian culture and, and still uh, not open to these dialogues and conversations. And, and it requires, I feel like it just requires media to really put more of a likes out there visually. And I think that's, that's normality. If you keep on pushing it, pushing that boundary, you, you can't have more than two Asian person in a movie. You can have more than one love interest happen to be. I, I, I see it and I just have, I, I get really frustrated when I watch a t movie or TV show when it's an Asian woman and then the love interest is going to be an African-American man. It's like, why are we stereotyping so much that every single time we see that and we're okay with it, it makes no sense sense to me why isn't that we embracing an asian woman loving an asian man <laughs> it, we don't see that very often in, in, in the movie making process it, but we're perpetuating that that stereotype and i i feel like that's what i mean by responsibility i feel like it's so <laughs> important for magazines like the cut like Nana Porter, the 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 marie claire's and the vogues to not just put faces that that they think it's the face rather than right. really listen to the consumer what those faces are and i fight that all the time i'm sure you heard of this when you're doing casting mm -hmm. i'm sure i'm guilty of it that we'll sit there and go is this person asian enough to be asian but diverse enough to still talk to all different asia because Asia's is yeah. massive right it's like oh I'm sure you you heard oh she's too chinese oh she's too thai right oh, oh, oh right. she's too much those conversations are crazy and they're still happening every day. I work with a lot of Asian, you know, her publications and, and we have those conversations still. I would be like, I love to shoot X, Y, and Z. And the editor might go, wow, um, that won't speak to this region of our customer. That won't speak to that right. region of customer. So it, it's, it is a balance act. You know, it's a constant well, when, balance when, act. When you work with like uh, an Asian magazine, right? And mm. you're doing the casting, you're involved in the casting. What are you seeing that they are looking for? Like, are they looking for, do they generally want one particular type of like, uh, you know what's funny? <laughs> this is funny. This is a great, great question. And, and, yeah. and I'm so glad you asked me because um, I don't talk about this very often, but it happens. In our industry, and so said, we'll use Vogue Thailand, for example, yeah. and Harper Singapore, the two of the most premier in that region. And Vogue Thailand makes initiative to make sure that they shoot with a local talent photographers, as well as a local team as much as possible. And when models visit Thailand, they photograph them. They really embrace their own culture and they make sure Thai Vogue speak to Thai audience. Unlike other 
Vogue publications that will turn it pretty much into American Vogue and trying to reach a different mm -hmm. audience, right? So yeah. for them, they're very much that way. I had an opportunity to work with them over six covers. And during yeah. that time, I became really close with editor-in-chief. And he had said to me, do you mind if my team is here to watch you work so they can learn and see how you work and how you progress in the Western way and, and technical and all that stuff. And, yeah. and so they can do it for our own magazine. And they have amazing photographers, but they just yeah. want to see how production work in the U.S. is very different, casting process, producing films. So I was happy to be part of that team and I still work with them. And that I love because they celebrate the local people, the regional people, I should say, they're not local people, they're the regional people. And that's important. But when you work with somebody like Harper's Bazaar Singapore with Kenneth Go, who's editor in chief there, um, he is very international in his yeah. approach because it's a designation that everyone in the world stops in Singapore before they right. hop to anywhere else. And yeah. it's an English speaking magazine. Mm -hmm. So naturally it has the Western flair. So for them, when we work together, we always try to get Asian models. We mm -hmm. always do. On the international level, we want an Asian model to represent the magazine. But yeah. here's what's tricky. And I don't know, you have find this or not, but casting Asian to shoot for an Asian regional magazine is harder than casting a Caucasian or African-American for those regions. Really, why? They, the, because the control of the booking is yeah. based on Western agents. It's oh, some see. guy sitting behind a desk yeah, yeah. telling me that their Asian model, supermodel, right. are not available to shoot for this publication, publication because she's too good for it, basically. And I still run into that. I, I still run into it. There's, you know, I, I, I might get myself in trouble saying this. There's a reason I haven't shot Lu Wen. You know, there's a reason yeah. I haven't shot Lu Wen. Lu Wen shoots a lot with Caucasian photographers. You know, and I called the agents on these. I was like, you guys, let's have this conversation. At what point did you guys think that I don't qualify to shoot a supermodel because I'm not Caucasian? Is that the conversation we should be having? I actually had this talk with the agent. And I said, what? And I, told, I said, it's, it's ridiculous to me that you as white as you can be, I'm not talking about a particular agent, white, whatever it is, but how much do you understand the Asian culture? And why are you saying no? to Harper Singapore, who is a publication of hers, that knows that Lu Wen would speak to the audience and you're telling me she's not going to do it and give me excuses that doesn't make sense. This happens all the time. I'm not just talking about Lu Wen. We yeah. can talk about Fei Fei. We can talk about all the yeah. six top models that are out there. And funny enough, Motis Girls, I work with in China together when we have yeah. television shows. They co-host with me on shows. So that conversation, it changes. While you're in Asia, or you in the United States. And I hope that conversation gets better because I get myself in trouble because you know me, I, I don't hold things back. So when I get on that phone with the agent, be, are you really seriously gonna tell me? <laughs> and like, maybe that's why I don't work with those <laughs> I work with them very much because I'm too honest. I need to say honest. But I do know that during this time, people are learning to adjust. And I always celebrate Asian models as much as I can. If everybody says to me, which model do you want to shoot? I'm always like, can I get Feifei? Right. Can I get Luann's? Because I want to show people that our community can work together and can stick together and amplify a message differently than just another photo shoot in America with a Western photographer. And nothing to do with skill set. I'm talking about just being able to celebrate our creativity together. And that's why I enjoy working with the Asian publications a lot. Um, because there is a synergy that's a little bit different, you know, and they, they, they allow me to be as Western as I can, and I am, but still always bring a little bit of uh, heritage and, and respect to the process, how we work. And that's, that's something that I know they appreciate. So yeah, long, sorry for the long answer, but no, the, the journey is, the journey is, it's, it's, it's frustrating for me, it's sitting on the side of a photographer side and creative side and still having those conversations, it's, it's tough for me. Do you feel like the images that like an Asian magazine will want are different than what like a Western magazine would want in terms of editorial? Well, because I shoot for hers and Condé Nast, which is yeah. very international based titles already, they're don't really, they, they, they love the international appeal. Even with the Asian model they want to cast, it may be somebody who has 1.5 million reach uh, okay. and a, a cross span of away from Australia all the way to Paris, right? And, and so for them, it's more about the reach. 
I think at the end of the day, it's not so much which region of Asia you're from, but the, the, the reach that you can get so they can really no different than business, they can get their dollars worth on, on you know, investment in that, in that model of celebrity on the cover. And I know for Harper's, there are many times that would be an Asian model that's super well known in a Western hemisphere, but still not well established in Asia. So there's a balance of the two. And, and, and some of them, you know, they, some of them do better in some market than others. That's just the way it is, right? It's, it's, right. it's how, how a business work. But I, I hope, my dream and hope of having these talks here and having conversation with you is that I know other people who are in the industry in position like you are listening. Um, they will make those adjustments and, and support the community. And I'm the first to say, hire the people who qualify first, right? That's most right. important. But when opportunity is there to have a voice and to be able to shine some light in our own culture, that's what this month is about. And that's what is yep. important to me. Right, right. And I think just like you said, being able to give your shine and being able to, I mean, we have a little bit of, uh, like you said, we are able to pick the people that we work with. And I think that when you have that opportunity, whether it be with freelance writers or makeup artists or anyone really, I think it's important to always give back in that way. Well, how's the conversation now um, in, in the midst of pandemic? How do you talk about beauty? How do you approach beauty when everybody's at home doing IG makeup tutorials? <laughs> How has that changed the dynamic of your magazine? I think that beauty is one of those things that is um, very dependent on context, right? So matter, no matter whether we're at home or we're outside, I think that beauty is reflective of that. So if everyone is at home doing IG makeup or they're at home just doing skincare, um, it doesn't really matter. I think like, I think that beauty has to be, what we do for the cut has to be adaptive and reflective of, I think of like what is going on outside and how people are living and you know, the who, what, where of what they're doing with beauty now. Um, so I think what we've been seeing is that a lot of people are, for example, experimenting with their hair and giving themselves like haircuts or having their partners like dye their hair and <laughs> that. And so that's been like really fun to see. Um, and I think it's also been fun to see too, like taking out that like performative aspect of makeup. Like I haven't, this is the first time I put on makeup in like since the pandemic started. And I put it on and I was like, wow, this this feels like a lot. Like I texted my <laughs> friends and I was like, I feel like a clown. Like this is so much, this is like, I went through my normal routine that I would probably I would go through every single day and I didn't even think about it um but I put it on all again today and I was like this feels like a lot especially if I'm not wearing makeup at all and um I I think that people will probably be maybe a little like more thoughtful I think when they go out and they'll think about like do I need to put this on my face especially since we all need to wear masks now we have to think about like do we want to put anything from here down is there even a point you know um um and beyond that I think like the the idea of beauty as self-care, right? Um, you can take it as far or as little as you want. If you don't think beauty is self-care, that's like totally fine too. Like, but I think like, like putting on a little moisturizer and like touching your skin and, or having someone do it for you just like feels nice. It's like a little form of like pleasure. And I think that if that can make you feel a little bit better, I think that's great. <laughs> But how do you cut through all the noises of everything that's so much of the, the, the beauty talk from, from yeah. novice to experts? How do you cut through all that from the cut? Pun intended. <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with the, the beauty novice, right? Like, I think everyone starts out as a novice. Um, I would, like, we're all novices. And I think there's How do you compete against that airwave, right? It, 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 it's what? over inundated. Instagram can't keep up with the lives that we're having all the time now. And how do you guys, what's the strategy? How do you get, get to your consumer, your, your, your audience in this such a crazy time? I think, like, it's, again, being, like, just aware of what's outside, right? What people are doing. Um, I don't think we can appeal to everyone. And that's, like, fine. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's too large. There's just, like, too many people, right? But, like, understanding our reader and knowing that our reader is maybe interested in, like, the IG live, interested in the IG makeup, but doesn't necessarily want to do, like, a 20-step beat every day. Like, that's probably not our reader. And that's, like, fine. They might be curious about aspects of it, but they're not the kind mm -hmm. of person that is going to do it. But they might, like, like listening to it for ASMR, and that's, like, okay. But I think, like, it's just, like, um, anything in life, right? Knowing who your your people are, knowing what you're interested in, and like being curious about it. Um, 
I think like that is probably the way that I think we stay connected to our reader, like understanding, like being curious, understanding who they are and what they like to read. But like, I think it's always good to be uh, just open to things. Inquisitive. I love that. Being yeah. curious. I guess that's a way, that's a way to deliver information that if you, you're writing a story because you're curious about it, most likely your consumer and us will be interested to hear it. I think that, that I guess that's the only way to keep things fresh because I, I, before our talk, I thought about that. I said, wow, you know, everybody's a beauty blogger now and everybody's right. giving, you know, everybody's giving their information of skincare and there's no authoritarian in the field any longer right now. It's really just completely washed. And yeah. somehow that, I, I guess the magazines like yours and the Harper's and the Vogue's, they will be able to at some point sift through all that information and give us the, the credible information, whether it's in beauty or whether it's in journalism, whatever that may be, because that is what the most scariest things right now is be able to get to the right info, right? Um, right. Last thing you want somebody to do a skincare routine at home and you follow it, you're highly allergic to that product or whatever that may be. Yeah. That's what I see that is so yeah. crazy right now. Like, everybody's now deemed the expert at cutting bangs at home. You know, I'm like, mm. <laughs> not doing that. <laughs> but I think that like, it's also, uh, it's nice too to see that there are like people experimenting at home within reason, within reason, right? Like I wouldn't recommend that someone go buy like a random acid off Amazon and then put on their face and then try to give themselves like some kind of peel, right? But like, I think that obviously a lot of people knock on influencers and knock on like Instagram makeup artists and whatnot. But I think that having um, the diverse, I think having those people as well is part of the, di di the part of the conversation. Oh, absolutely. Think, right? When I saw Mac using transgender, you know, as the faces for their brand, I go, now we're moving the meter. Now we're talking when, when Beverly yeah. Hills Anastasia, who has in the, she was the first to be on right. Instagram and sure. using again, you know, transgenders and, and, and cross makeup, whatever, however, the terms are fluid makeup artists putting makeup on their self. And it was super fascinating for me to watch and learn because this is all, our, our business is, as we all know is fashion is fantasy, fantasy is beauty, beauty is fantasy. Everything goes back right. to fantasy, right? And, and this is part of some people's fantasy and why would we not put a, spy, uh, a spotlight on it and showcase it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the true experts in our industry are really just like makeup artists and dermatologists, right? Mm. I mean, my job as the beauty editor, I don't even think it's as an authority, but I have access to the authorities and to be able to be curious and asking questions that like consumers and like regular people would want to know. Um, but I think that, I mean, if there's anything that like is ever painful and you put on your face, you should definitely take it off. <laughs> Well, there's a lesson for you guys out there. Don't just go online and follow whatever IG you see because it may not work for your skin. So yeah. the cut, is that a, a, a everyday brand new fee kind of magazine format or is it a quarterly? Tell us a little bit more about that. It's every day. Uh, I'm not sure how many articles we publish a day, but we definitely do at least three in the beauty sphere. So every single mm. day there's three new beauty articles. Um, and every single month we have a new digital cover star. Uh, last month was Chloe Sevigny and we did like a, oh, a really love cool her. Zoom photo shoot. Cause I mean, I was gonna ask you too, like how you guys were shooting in this pandemic. For us, we did a we did a photo shoot via Zoom where we, I think our stylist styled her through Zoom. I think Chloe's boyfriend is a gallerist of some type. So obviously there was some help there cause he was able to help with like the set styling and things like that. And the photographer shot it through Zoom. But I'm curious like what you guys are for me, well, I have a lot of requests for September issue, which is amazing because yeah. I'm quite technical, so I can figure things out. And I'm also on the West Coast where the, the air is not as um, congested with the hot spots of the coronavirus. So I everybody wants to shoot on Zoom. I, I'm not saying no to it, but I just don't understand why you're not just shooting with a Zoom lens. Why are you not just shooting with a, a 1200 Zoom super sports lens that you can be five streets path and, and and still be able to pull the focus I, oh, I, I, I think it's there's a nostalgia right now a style it's fun I think it's actually fun for people to go oh yeah. I shot this on Facebook I shot this through Zoom um, has now never been part of my vocabulary and probably yeah. because I'm so busy doing the talk show so I haven't really dived into that style of shooting um, can be done but there are a couple of shoes I have been planning and they're all 
so far, I like to bring more normalcy to the process rather than stick with what the environment's giving us. I want to be able to, to say, okay, let's create a safe space where you can have uh, distance from me and we'll be able to shoot that way. So. You doing no hair, no makeup then? Or is it just you and the other person? Oh, the hair make makeup we can really do in retouching, just so you know, guys. I can build a whole entire <laughs> face. And people hair, you give them instructions and a little simplicity, it really does yeah. help in the two to get them there. Well, we're running out of time because we talk so long because we have so much to talk about. We should do this again. I know. We could talk all day. And thank you so much for putting on makeup because you look amazing <laughs> and beautiful. And the funny thing, the reason I say that because for every day when I get up, if I don't have this show, I don't put on a clean shirt and I don't feel like I'm <laughs> up and going. And it does really, really help to build my spirit. And this week, exactly. be able to speak to fellow Asian Americans makes me so proud to, to say that I'm part of the community and thank you for being part of it. And also continuously be aware of it and put work out there that celebrates us. And that's all we can ask for. No, thank you so much for having me. This is so fun. And I'm glad that we could do this, especially since it's the last week of EPHM month. And it's a nice way to end things on a really high note. <laughs> Absolutely. Of, well, well meanwhile, we'll continue talking and create together when we have, to, have yes. the opportunity to. And we'll talk more about how to shoot remotely. Maybe we can come up with something and, and attack it together. Because I love to sort out our little technical issues, you know. But in the meantime, please stay healthy out there and stay strong and your family as well. And thank you again for being part of Let's Talk. You too. Thank you everyone for watching. Bye-bye. Well, that was the beautiful Kathleen Ho from The Cut, New York Magazine. And it's so interesting to meet people from, from different regions and different areas. And and I know her for, for many, many years and we have never yet worked together. She's a fellow Taiwanese. So it's nice to have a little connection of uh, speaking through food and travel. And, and I think at this time it's so important we all remember that we also connected in so many ways and because it is asian pacific american <laughs> heritage month that that i get the opportunity to be here and celebrate that with you guys and talk a little bit about my culture and, and share the people in america who are asian working in industry is so refreshing and and i'm grateful for the opportunity so thank you guys for joining me until we meet again you guys stay safe and stay healthy out there Thank you.